This has been a historic couple weeks here in our nation, definitely in our city here in the Houston area and across uh, the globe. And I thought it'd be important for us to talk about gospel in race this week and next, uh, just in the midst of all that's happening. And today I want to talk to you about the wounding and the healing. Um, these last two weeks, as, as we've seen the death of George Floyd, obviously we saw that across mass media, and his death has really become a, a symbol, a flashpoint. We've seen his mural painted on city walls, and we see that iconic phrase, his words, I can't breathe. And this, this symbol, this flashpoint ha has just uh, revealed the deep hurt, the mistrust, the anger in our nation about racism. That's what I want to talk to us about today, racism. But I want to make sure that we're all speaking the same language here and that our words mean the same things. And so I'm just going to put up here a, a definition of racism. This is from the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. And here's what it says. It says, the belief that race is the primary determinant of human traits and capacities and that racial differences produce an inherent superiority of a particular race. A couple words that I want you to see in that definition. The first is belief. Racism is a belief that is held by human beings like you and like me, right? It's a belief system in which we believe that race is the primary determinant of human traits and capacities. The second word is superiority, that this belief leads us to conclude that one race is superior to another race, or we could say that in the opposite way, that one race is inferior to another race. This is the real essence of racism. And today, I want us to look at a passage from a minor prophet named Hosea. It comes from Hosea chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, and I believe that it speaks something important to us about the things that we're experiencing right now in regards to racism in our nation. You're going to find Hosea in the latter half of your Old Testament. Uh, he had a pretty unique calling that God called this prophet to marry uh, an adulterous woman, a prostitute, and it was to display what it was like for God to be in covenant relationship with the people of Israel, a people that kept always turning away, turning aside, going after other lovers, other things, and pursuing other, um, other avenues for human flourishing other than a relationship with God. And so in Hosea chapter 6, he, he issues this call. It's a beautiful call, and I think it reveals something important to us about our God. Let's read Hosea chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. He says, Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us, and he will heal us. He has wounded us, and he will bind up our wounds. He will revive us after two days, and on the third day, he will raise us up so we can live in his presence. Let us strive to know the Lord. His appearance is as sure as the dawn. He will come to us like the rain, like the spring showers that water the land. This is the word of the Lord. I want to propose a question to you. And here's the question. What if God has wounded us in order to heal us? We had a, a dramatic experience. It has nothing to do with race or racism. It has to do with our family pet. We have a dog named Scout. And the other day we were outside and the dog got bit by another dog in our neighborhood. We didn't think a whole lot about it until she starts bleeding all over our house. And my wife rushes the dog along with my older son to the vet's office. 
Now, thanks to coronavirus, my wife and son and a bleeding dog wait in the car for five and a half hours waiting to see the vet. And finally, once the vet got to see our dog and he examines her and works on her, he tells my wife what he has to do. And he uses a phrase that was interesting to me. The phrase was, he had to lance the wound. Now, I'm not a a medical person, so I I didn't really know what that meant. So he explained that to my wife, which she explained to me, which is that in lancing a wound, what the the doctor has to do is go into that, that injury, and they actually have to take their utensils and dig around inside of it. Now, just imagine the pain of having your injury re-injured, but the reason why they do this is that there's residue of bacteria and things that can get trapped inside those wounds. And if they do, that wound will never heal correctly. Hosea reveals God to us in a way in which we begin to see a God who both tears and heals, a God who wounds and who binds up our wounds. And I just want to ask you, is your theology big enough for a God like that? To tear or to wound is to inflict Pain. Now, one definition of evil in our time is anything that causes pain or suffering is evil. And in some ways, we could say, yeah, I, I get that. I understand that, defi- that definition of evil. But let's take another example, running, right? I am, I am not a, a super fit person. So when I run, I am in pain. Is that evil? Of course not. It's leading me to good health. Or another example, the doctor who has to set a broken bone, it's painful. Or who has to lance a wound, again, it creates pain, but it's only on the other side of that wounding or that pain or that suffering that true healing is possible. And Hosea promises us, he's not just the God who wounds. He's not just the God who tears. He's the God who heals. Verse one, he tells us, he will heal us. He will bind up our wounds. And as we consider the outcry, as we consider this, 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 national outrage about racism, we have to ask ourselves, what can heal this? This wound, it feels like this bandage has been ripped off and we've seen it and we see the, the, the nastiness that's still down inside that wound and we have to know what in the world could heal this. Well, plenty of people are proposing all kinds of solutions that they think will heal this, right? Capitalism, socialism, anarchy of Antifa or other groups, uh, money, time, uh, outrage, looting, rioting, and yet none of these are actual solutions that have healing power. And surely, absolutely, there are systems that need to be reformed. But friends, new wineskins need new wine. Here's my big idea today. I don't want you to miss this. I'd like you to consider that the gospel of Jesus has better resources to meet the issue of racism than any other solution. I'll say it again because it's so important. The gospel of Jesus has better resources to meet the issue of racism than any other solution. Have you considered the healing resources contained in the gospel of Jesus?
today, what I'd like to do is just kind of flip through a Rolodex of truths that we have in the gospel of Jesus. This God who heals has a way of healing. And what I want to propose to you is that the healing is actually inside this gospel of Jesus. And so let's just look at the elements of healing that we find inside the gospel of Jesus. The first is this, it bestows human dignity. The gospel of Jesus bestows human dignity. How? Well, our story begins with a God who creates, a God who speaks worlds into being, and he creates human beings in his image, male and female. The gospel also tells us that out of this man and woman who he says, be fruitful and multiply, that God eventually creates all the nations of the earth, that all of us have the same family tree, and it leads us all the down to that, that, that beginning point, and that we are all image bearers of the Most High God, which means that all of us have dignity. And male alone did not uh, solely reflect the image of God, and female alone did not solely reflect the image of God, and white did not solely reflect the image of God, and black did not solely reflect the image of God, and brown did not solely reflect the image of God, and yellow did not solely reflect the image of God. It's like all of it was needed and necessary to comprehend the fullness of God's image within humanity. This gospel bestows human dignity. It reveals the God who loves his image bearing human beings. He loves them so much that he would lay down the life of his son on a cross to, to demonstrate, to show the keystone act of him bestowing value and worth. Why would God die for human beings if he didn't value them, if they didn't have intrinsic dignity? So these truths establish that human dignity and value to every person, no matter of skin color or race, and it teaches us to combat the devaluing of any person based on skin color or race, or any other characteristic. It also leads us to uh, not only combat racism, but to fight things like human trafficking and to advocate for the unborn by seeking an end to abortion. Uh, the second gospel resource that we can't miss is that the gospel of Jesus establishes equality. It establishes equality. Here's what I mean. The cross of Jesus is this great equalizer because it's at the cross of Jesus where all of us learn that we've all fallen short, right? Each of us has turned away. We've all fallen short of God's glory. We've all fallen short of his commands. We've rebelled. We've turned away. We've, we've done things that we shouldn't do. And all of us equally are in need of the salvation and forgiveness that only come through Jesus Christ. This gospel tells us that all of us must humble ourselves at this cross. As Jesus said, we must deny ourselves. We must lay down our lives. We must take up our cross and we would find our life. We would actually lose it for him and his sake. This gospel, it inverts the worldly power structures of inequality. <laughs> Jesus said that the meek would inherit the earth. Right? We're taught that the way up is the way down, that the rich should tremble and that the poor should rejoice. We, we learn that the weak will be made strong and the strong will be made weak and the first will be last and the last will be first. You see, the gospel of Jesus establishes a quality and there's level ground at the foot of the cross of Jesus. Third gospel resource I don't want you to miss is that the gospel of Jesus promises true justice. And oh, how we yearn for true justice today. 
Psalm 37 tells us that he's the God who loves justice. Psalm 89 tells us that righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne, right? That he's the God who sets the standard of righteousness and justice. And here's the thing, that our redefinitions of justice or righteousness will always fail to produce human flourishing because God in his judgment will not allow any other standard to work because he's the one who promises true justice. He gives us this model for the church Right? We're the foretaste of heaven. We're the foretaste of this kingdom that is coming, that is here, but that will come in fullness when God comes to make a new heavens and a new earth. And it will be a kingdom of true justice. And so we are to be a people of justice right now, seeking justice for the oppressed and the marginalized and the voiceless. But wait, there's more than that. There's more resources than that. The gospel of Jesus calls for responsibility, right? This savior that humbles himself on a cross that raises again three days later, who ascends to the right hand of the father. He tells John in the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 22, verse 12, he says, look, I'm coming soon. My reward is with me to repay each person according to his work. Each person according to his work. This gospel of Jesus calls each one of us to personal responsibility. That this faith is not just some theological thing that we set up on the shelf of our, of our hearts and minds, but it's something that leads us to action, that the inworking of grace bears fruit in the outworking of right living, and that each of us are called to accountability before the God who sees everything and knows everything. This gospel shakes us out of passivity, and it moves us to holy actions because we're responsible. One more thing, not the last thing, there's endless things that we could talk about. One more thing that I don't want you to miss, miss is that the gospel of Jesus releases forgiveness. Oh, and this is so important for us. Our gospel reveals a God who gets angry about injustice. He gets angry about people who turn away from his ways, people that he, he lavishes with grace, and yet they turn away in rebellion. And this God who's angry, who has wrath, he comes up with a solution, but it's, it's a total twist in the story. Isaiah 53, 5 and 6 paints it so beautifully for us says, but he, talking about Jesus, the Messiah that would come, was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities. The punishment for our peace was on him, and we were healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We all have turned to our own way, and the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us, all. The God who's angry about all of his people turning away from him, about humanity going its own direction and, and rebelling against him, his plan is this. He's going to sacrificially send his son Jesus and put all of that, that iniquity and wrongdoing upon him so that he could release forgiveness. And if God can forgive me, then I can forgive you. And if God can forgive you, then you can forgive me. He's the God who wounds us to heal us and then heals us by his wounds. There's so much more we could say, but I think 
these give you an, an idea of the essence of the resources that we find in the gospel of Jesus, bestowing human dignity, establishing equality, promising true justice, calling for responsibility, and releasing forgiveness. As the, uh, the drama continued with our beloved pet scout, one of the things that we had to do was we had to change those bandages twice a day. Now, that was quite a feat uh, of me having to kind of take that dog and restrain the animal so that my wife could peel the old bandage off. And every time that she would do this, we would both look at it and we would see that wound and we would think to ourselves or sometimes verbalize, I thought it would be more healed than this. I was thinking about that in regards to our nation. I wonder if maybe you've had the thought or the feeling that I thought it would be more healed than this. I resonated with what so many posted on Blackout Tuesday where they said, I'm listening and I'm learning. You see, while we know the gospel has resources to, um, to meet the issue of racism in our time, unfortunately, as we look at the history of the church, what we've seen is a church that was actually working against the gospel's call against racism. We see a muddled and mixed up history when it comes to Christianity and race. At one time, Christians walked in step with slavery, then gradually came to oppose it, but they left this racism unchecked. Some Christians committed atrocities against African Americans, and yet civil rights was championed by Christians. We have this bizarre history, this muddled and mixed history. But what I learned as I was just kind of learning this week is I saw that there was this progressive journey within the church where it's like the gospel just kind of went a little bit deeper and a little bit further and a little bit more progress was made. And today, as we talk about what this means for us, I just want to ask you, would you allow the gospel to go a little further in you? Because perhaps God himself has lanced the wound of racism because he wants to remove some impurities in us. If racism is a belief that's held in human hearts, then we first must address human hearts. And today, I want you to start with your heart. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to ask God to show you any place in you where the residue of racism still remains. The residue of racism still remains. Now, Many of us, we, we may not even think of ourselves as racist or having any kind of racist tendencies or, or ideas or thoughts, but there's this residue generationally that kind of gets handed down to us. Maybe when you were little, you heard people talking in a certain way that just created a certain understanding in your mind that has left a residue of racism in you. And so just to help us process that question of asking God, I just want to maybe ask some follow-up questions that will help you think through that question before the Lord. So, what are the prejudices that you hold? What thoughts come into your mind when you see a person of a different skin color? How have you prejudged black people, brown people, yellow people, red people, or white people? How have you prejudged them? In what ways do you think of yourself as superior or of others as inferior? What suspicions do you have about people of a different race? Or what arguments or ideas do you use to downplay or minimize the experiences 
of others. Ask God to show you any place in you where the residue of racism still remains. New wineskins need new wine. Racism is a belief system that resides in hearts. We have to begin with our hearts first. And then, like Hosea, we could say to the world, come, let us return to the Lord. Will you come with us? Will you let the gospel go a little further and deeper into your heart? Would you let it get down into all of life and speak to the parts of us where God might be lancing out the residue of racism? 